Today is Thursday, March 20th, 2008. I am H.F. Williamson. I am interviewing Jim Fisher for the Veterans History Project of the Library of Congress American Folklife Center. We are at Studio X Campbell Hall on the University of Illinois campus in Urbana, Illinois. Henry Radcliffe is the Director of Lighting, Sound, and Camera. Jim, I'd like you to start out telling me where you were, what you were doing before you were called up and how you came to join the Navy. Well, I was uh, working in Chicago in a machine shop with uh, where my brother-in-law worked and uh, I, my uh, wife's cousin, wasn't my wife at the time, but her cousin and I decided to join the Navy one day. What that time? Was, what year? What date? Was, it was in 42. Okay. So we joined the Navy on the f June 1st, 1942. And, uh, how, so, how quickly after you joined were you sent off to uh, your basic training, your boot camp? Oh, right away. Okay. Right away. It went to Great that? Lakes. At Great Lakes? Great Lakes boot camp, yeah. Then after that, I went to school at Iowa State, electrical school. Had that been your choice or did they select you? Well, I wanted to go to gunner's mate school, but you know, I wanted to fire the big guns. <laughs> but uh, they sent me to electrician's mate school. How long was that program? That was uh, more than four months from like from August until December, I think it was. And uh, then after that, I think it went to, let's see. I went to uh, Gyro Compass School in San Francisco. And uh, it seemed like I went to another school too, but anyway. Were you being trained to be on a particular type of ship or this was just general training for all types of ships? <clears throat> it was a, a general training, but see, at that time, they needed a bunch of guys to man these LSTs. So that's how I became an LST crewman. And, uh, but, the, but the training was general. It wasn't specific for LST only. So no. you could have gone on any type oh, yeah. of ship if necessary. Yeah. So you've now finished your schools, and where were you assigned to join your craft? To uh, Vancouver, Washington. Oh. And uh, I went aboard this ship here. LSC 475, and I was on that f until... When had that ship been commissioned? Oh, uh, I put it in commission. Okay, you were a yeah. plank owner. I was a plank owner, yeah. And I was in on that ship for, let's see, from March 17th, 1943 until December, f uh, no, wait a minute, uh, until September. Uh, 1945. Wow. Two and a half years, maybe entire, a little more. Almost the entire war. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So how long did you train as a crew off of off of the United States before not, you went? Not very long. Really? We just, we just took the ship down the Columbia River on, uh, you know, first trip to make sure everything was all right. And then we were going to leave right away, but uh, there was a big storm in the Pacific. And they didn't want to let us go out until that storm got over. So we stayed in Astoria, Oregon for two or three days. And then uh, then we went on down to San Diego, I think it was, yeah. And then came back up to Frisco and they put a bunch of guns on our, on our ship, more guns. We had a, a lot of guns on our ship. Well, these were installed on your ship. You weren't just carrying. They weren't cargo, they were part of your armament. Yeah, yeah, several, several, seven, let's see, three, seven, seven twenties at that time. And then we had three inch gun and several fifties, 50 caliber right. machine guns. Were some of those anti-aircraft or were they all 
Yeah, they were yeah. all for anti-aircraft. Yeah. Yeah. Now, was this the typical armament on an LSD? Or? Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah. But I think we had a few more than some of the other LSTs. We were, we were pretty well armed. A plane never, none of those kamikaze planes ever got to us. Well, you'll have to tell us more about that when we get to when you're out on the Pacific Theater. Yeah. So you're, you're finally, you have your armament on and you're getting ready to take off, I assume. Yeah, or, we left uh, May 2nd from Frisco. Now, when you go, are you by yourself or are you with other ships? Mm, there might have been a couple of other LSCs, but there wasn't any escort. We just went right on over to Pearl Harbor. And that was a pretty safe place to go, you know, between Pearl Harbor and the United States. So there wasn't much risk of submarines between yeah. that? Okay. No. How long were you at Pearl? About a week. One week. One but week or less. Not for much training, just to get ready to go. Yeah, we had we had a cargo that uh, that they um, you know dropped off of Pearl Harbor, and then we loaded. Seems like a, oh. I don't remember them loading much stuff on at Pearl Harbor. But. Uh, then we went from there to down to Samoa. How long a trip was that? Well, that was a, about 2,000 mile trip. Wow. And then from there we went to the New Hebrides. Now, in your training, had you practiced landings at all? No. Really? Mm -mm. Oh my gosh. No. No, they sent us over there without ever even beaching in the ship any place. Yeah. Why? Well, they wanted to get us over there. Okay. And actually, it's not that hard to run a ship on, up on the beach. The main thing is that you don't drop the stern anchor too quick. <laughs> and I was the one that operated the stern anchor. Oh, well, then you needed practice. <laughs> well, they, one time we lost it because, the, you know, you'd get the order to drop the stern anchor. And that's all you could do, you know, you had to obey orders. And the ship kept going and going and going and never hit the beach. And the cable come out of the cable drum. And we still hadn't hit the beach. So we lost it. And that was a big job getting that back. Boy. 24 hours before we got it all, all the cable back. 900 feet of cable. That's a lot of cable. And there's cable this big around. Oh, God. Did you have to do it manually, or? Well, they took the boat, a uh, small boat, and uh, with a grappling hook, and they caught the cable about in the middle of it, which was a kind of bad thing to do. If they could have got the end of it, it would have made it a lot easier, because we could have hooked it right to the drum and wrapped it up. Mm. But uh, we had to take that cable and lay it out on the deck 900 feet of it, and uh, finally, let's see, that took over 24 hours, just about the whole crew. And we got back and then uh, wrapped it up on the drum, and uh, that was it. <laughs> got the anchor back. We got everything back, right. but it just took a lot of time. A day you didn't want to spend again, I bet. Oh. <clears throat> well, anyway, I interrupted you. So you, you, you traveled from Pearl to Samoa and then further on, and what, were you, what was the ship assigned to do in those days? Well, from, uh, let's see, from New Hebrides, we went to uh, Brisbane, Australia. And then from uh, Brisbane, we loaded up over 4,000 cases of beer in Brisbane <laughs> on a tank deck and some other stuff. Some Pepsi-Cola or Coca-Cola, and then we went up to New Guinea. And uh, we got up to New Guinea about uh, August 13th in 43. And after we got there, we had a LCT on, on our main deck. And after we got up there to, uh, to Milne Bay, we put a 
12 degree list on the ship to starboard and uh, slid that LCT off. It looked like it was going to sink when it hit the water. So it went way down. And let's see, after that, then we, we prepared to make some landings. I don't know, I don't ever remember any practice landings. The, the, except the first, the first invasion we made at Lay, New Guinea, that's about the first landing that I ever remember of. This was under fire? Oh yeah. Yeah, I mean, so that was your, that was your practice landing, was a real one. Yeah. Quite now, what, were you, what were you carrying up on the beach? Uh, I think we had some tanks and a lot of trucks and a lot of army equipment. And, uh, and which wave was your ship in, roughly? Which wave what? Which wave? Oh. Were there other ships ahead of you or were you one no, of the first? No, we, we were the first ones. There was only six of us and we all went into the same beach. But there were some LCIs that... Uh, those guys that were on those LCIs really got, those LCIs had ramps on both sides of the ship. Oh. And as they, the soldiers came off of those ramps, ran down those ramps, they were perfect targets. A lot of them got killed. But, uh, How did your ships do? Were any of them damaged? Mm, mm. On this landing, I mean? Were any what? Were any of your ships damaged by the enemy fire on your landing, or? No. Okay. No. We didn't even get hit. Good. We unloaded and got off the beach, and but the thing that happened before we got to this landing is we were attacked by about thirty Japanese planes, and that was in the afternoon of. The midnight landing. See, we landed at midnight, which was a bad thing to do. After that, we never landed at, at, at dark anymore. We always landed in the daytime. So you could see, you know? Right, yeah, of course. Yeah. So how many, you said that the Japanese, 30 some airplanes attacked you? Yeah. That's you and the other six or seven ships? And yeah, and <clears throat> a friend of mine got killed on the other ship, a ship about 300 feet away. And on that ship, one of the guys got the Congressional Medal of Honor. They were only 300 feet away from us. On this invasion? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. This was, this was in the afternoon before the midnight invasion. And uh, that's when those planes attacked us. Were they stationed on that island and were trying to defend the island, I assume? Yeah, the yeah. Japs, the Japs you mean? Yeah. Oh yeah. But these planes, see, they came in and attacked the convoy before we ever got there because they knew they had a pretty good idea what we were going to do, so yeah. they did all the damage they could do before we got there. And that, now, this convoy includes other LSTs. Does it also include destroyers or cruisers or any capital ships? Well, destroyers, and uh, there were maybe a couple of them. There, this really wasn't a big invasion, but... Uh, it was a, a bad one as far as I'm concerned because it really, you know, a friend of mine got killed on the other, one of the other ships. I, don't understand, I can understand. Yeah. Yeah. So that was the first invasion that your craft had been in. Mm -hmm. Now what happens after that? Do you continue taking things to the beach after the first wave? or? Well, we just went on in and unloaded and got off of the beach. So you don't, there's no, there's no additional trips to the beach? Well, I don't, we may have gone back up there again from Milne Bay up to Ley. That's, that's about 300 or 400 mile run. Oh. It's uh, quite a ways. And I, I don't remember if we made a resupply run or right. not. But this 473 that got hit, they, they, they took them to Australia, and, and they were down in Australia for over a year getting fixed up. That's how bad they got yeah. hit. So when you're, now that this invasion is, you're done, what, what do you do next? 
Well, we made several more in New Guinea, and let's see. We made an invasion at uh, New Breton Island, and that was a bad one. We got stuck on the beach and couldn't get off. And, uh, and you're under fire at this time? Yeah. Can you fire back with your 50 calibers? or? Well, I don't remember them doing that so much, but what happened, they were trying to pull us off of the seagoing tug, an Australian seagoing tug, and they had a cable. Let's see, they hooked it to our cable, yeah, our stern anchor cable. And they started trying to pull us off, and we had our engines going full speed astern, and first one, then the other, so the ship would kind of go back and forth like that. Trying to wiggle off the beach right. is what we were trying to do. Like a snake. <laughs> yeah, but it, it didn't work. Uh, finally, when they were pulling on us real hard like that, that darn cable broke. Oh, no. And another guy and I were on the fantail. That was my station, fantail. And that cable missed my head by about that far, I guess. Coming right over our head. But uh, got out of that all right. And then the next morning, when the tide came in, we got off the beach. And uh, of course, that was a landing where there were even mines. They had mines out in the, before we could get into the beach. There were mines in the water. Did any of them, any of the ships hit the mines? No, not that I know of. But you know, it's kind of, they were watching out for them I real bet. close, you yeah. know. Very carefully. You know. So, I mean, is it a little unnerving to spend a whole night on the beach with yeah under fire or yeah not so much under fire but the the Japs the, we got a report that the uh, the Japs had broken through the Marines lines and they were coming toward the ships so then they issued everybody a gun you know like a forty five just just in case the Japs did get on board the ship or to try to keep them off right. But they never did. They never did make it. They never did uh, get on board the ship. And the next day, next morning, later on in the morning, we got off. When the tide off came the in. beach, you know. Yeah. So those are your first two invasions. Yeah. <clears throat> I got a, a whole uh, story about that. The captain wrote about it. The, the night that would never end. That was the title of it, that he titled it, because it, it was a long night. Yeah. Especially when you'd been told the Japanese had broken through the lines. Oh, yeah. yeah. So how much time do you have to recover after that invasion? Well, okay. sometimes maybe a week or so. We made a lot of invasions in, in New Guinea, several of them, probably... Probably at least eight of them, D-Day landings, D-Day invasions, whatever you want to call them. And then, uh, I don't think that people realize how much went on in New Guinea because this oh. was early on and they were, yeah. the Japanese had gotten that far, right? And then. Yeah, they were getting ready to get in Australia. Exactly. From Port Moresby, they were going to go on into Australia. Yeah. What were some of the other aspects of those the remaining invasions of New Guinea you remember that you'd like to talk about? Well, one anniversary of it's coming up pretty quick, April 22nd. There was a, we were supposed to make a landing at Hollandia, New Guinea. And uh, I heard the, the minister talking to all the soldiers on the fantail, which was my station, General Quarter Station, and uh, they were telling the men that there was going to be probably at least 70% casualties. Uh, you know, that's a lot. These are the, the, the troops you were carrying? Yeah. Yeah, we probably had three or 400 on the ship. But uh, we, let's see, about 6 o'clock in the morning, they were shelling the beach, and we went in about seven, 
and uh, there weren't any Japs there. They'd all ran up in the, into the hills. Oh. And one guy got, uh, let's see, uh, shot himself in the foot, and another guy drowned in a swamp. Actually, there was only one casualty death on that landing. But they were, they really, we, we thought that that was really going to be a bad landing. Now, do you ever get a, a leave, a rest and recreation in this, uh, during this period, or is it continuous? No, not until uh, 44, February 44, we went to Australia. That was, what, a year or more later? Yeah, let's see, well, yeah, we, we left in May of 43, and then we had this leave in February 44. So you're out there continuously for nine months. Yeah. Now, once the New Guinea campaign is completed, are there some additional invasions that your ship is involved in? Yeah. New Britain. Well, let's see. Did I tell you about New Britain? No, I didn't tell you about New Britain. No. <clears throat> oh, that, that's, that's where we got stuck on the beach, New Britain. Yeah, I told you about that. Uh, oh, the night that never ended. That would never end, yes. Yeah. And then, uh, see, we, we just went on up the coast of New Guinea. After Hollandia, let's see, what one was that? I got a list of all of them at home in the order of which, which we did. And, uh, but you essentially were in every invasion of the island, yeah. Just about, just about. And then after we got done with New Guinea, that's when we went up to the Philippines and landed on October 20th, 44, which was my 20th birthday. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. You weren't even old enough to vote yet. <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> no, you were 21. Yeah. Yeah. Now, while you're doing these, are, are the invasions of some of the other islands like Iwo Jima and Guadalcanal taking place? So there are other... Well, Guadalcanal was over with before I ever got go oh, okay. even uh, before I even got over there. But see, there, there was a Central Pacific unit that was making landings in uh, Central Pacific, like Guam and different places like that. You know, so that's a talk. different theater. You're mm -hmm. in a different theater, yeah. 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 We were, the theater I was in was... Uh, General MacArthur was... Uh, the kingpin, and most of the landings were pretty well planned, and, and we didn't suffer a lot of casualties like they did at Tarawa, or, you know, that that was, uh, there was over a thousand Marines killed on Tarawa. That was a different command theater, right? That was, was that the Navy command over? The Central Pacific, I think it was, I don't know if it was Nimitz. Or Halsey, uh, someone, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, that, they really, they didn't get the Marines ashore and they had to wade through water at about this deep and while they were doing that, they were getting shot at from the Japs on the beach and they just, I think there was over a thousand casualties. They couldn't get the craft up on the beach because of the coral and everything? Yeah. Well, you, I interrupted you when you said you were, you were landing in the Philippines. What was, you want to talk, tell us more about that? Yeah, that. Well, you heard of Tokyo Rose? Yes. Well, she, you, might, you might explain briefly who she is in case... Well, she used to try to demoralize all of us uh, sailors and soldiers over there. And uh, she would say that uh, the Leyte Gulf was a graveyard for LSTs which uh, it kind of turned out for us because when we went in there, we hit a sandbar, and it stuck on a sandbar, you know? How far away from the well, beach? We, we were probably, you know, maybe half a mile or maybe longer oh than that. And, uh, but we were lucky, we got off, and uh, we went on into the beach and unloaded. But before all this happened, one Japanese plane came over 
and every damn ship was shooting at that airplane. And never, nobody ever hit him. He came down like this between the ships, and the gunners just followed him right on down, see? And a lot of ships shot each other. I was wondering, yeah. Yeah. And was he strafing you? As, was no, he, he just was fooling around, I think, trying to draw fire. Okay. Trying to do what he, what he did best, got the ships to fire into each other. But he never got hit. So then he took off, went way up, and went out of sight. But later on, we found out that a P-38 got him. Oh. But there must have been a million dollars worth of ammunition fired at him. Including your ship? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So after that ship came, then, then, then the landing occurred? After we got off the beach? Yeah. I mean, was that a very hot beach? Or were you under fire? No. OK. No. But there were some pretty gruesome sights at that beach which I didn't go to see. They said, the guys at, on the bow were telling me that there had been a pillbox right there, at, right in front of the, where we uh, beached. And there were, I guess it had, it had sustained a direct hit because there were some legs standing up in there yet. This is from the bomb, the bomb, the ship bombardment had direct hit it, yeah. yeah. I didn't even go up to see it because that was enough for me. I guess. So anyway, we got out of that all right. But a month later when we went up there to resupply the, uh, the troops, that was uh, when they started using kamikaze planes. That was the first ones. And, uh, I saw two hospital ships got hit that day with kamikaze planes. And uh, we had, I think that day we shot down about two or three planes that came at us. Your LST did, mm -hmm. good. Yeah. So the LSTs were targets for the kamikaze planes? Oh yeah, yeah. sure. They, they would uh, go after anything. But they didn't, uh, we heard that the pilots in those planes were half drunk when they took off. They gave them, or they gave them sake to drink while they were flying toward their target. And that's why, uh, well, that's probably one of the reasons why we didn't get hit. But we did shoot two or three down that day. But at least some of them were successful in, oh, in yeah. attacking ships of... They sunk some some LSCs up at, I think it was at Iwo Jima they sunk some. They sunk some destroyers with kamikaze planes. Yeah, they did a lot of damage. And they, they, there are pictures of them attacking some of the even larger capital ships too. So yeah. That was quite a devastating Aircraft weapon. carriers. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 So was this, was this one of your last invasions? This, uh, no, we had uh, another bigger one. Oh, Lingayen Gulf. That was a. That was a. That convoy that went up there, invasion convoy. It was over 30 miles long. And uh, we did get hit up there in the bow doors. It blew a hole about that big around. What do you think hit you? Uh, mortar shell. Oh. Yeah, it wounded uh, two or three soldiers that were right there. It was, uh, then up there they were, we had, uh, they told us Japs were swimming underneath boxes and coming up to the ships and putting charges on the ships, you know, blowing them up. So any box you saw, <laughs> you know, it was, I don't know if there was anybody under any of those boxes <laughs> or not, but. You, did you ever hear of a ship actually being attacked by a swimmer, or was this? Well, a... no, really. But they said they see they put out a lot of information like that to keep you on the ball. Right. You know. That's smart. You know, over there in in later on in uh, 
you know when that destroyer coal got bombed over in Yemen? Right. You see, they weren't even watching for anything like that. Yeah. They should have been because they were in a hostile port. But they weren't, and that's what happened. You know, that, that, that was a bad, blew a 17-foot hole in that ship. A, little, that a bring, small little inflatable boat or whatever it was. Yeah. You see, during, during the war, you don't, you don't let anything like that go by. If anything like that was coming at us, we'd just shoot first and, yeah. you know. Better be safe. Right. So this might, how, large, how long a beach was this invasion if it was a 30 mile long convoy? Oh, yeah, I don't know. Lingayen Gulf is uh, it's starting from the north. It's, it starts like this and comes way down like this and goes back up. So ships were landing all around in there. Sort of like a D-Day size invasion. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah, there was a lot of... And then those guys that landed there, they went on down, uh, worked their way south toward Manila. The troops that landed there. Before you get to them, how big, how much opposition was there on the beach there? When your craft well, came in? Well, as far as we were concerned, well, we got hit. But uh, there didn't seem to be that much, uh, I mean, opposition as far as we were concerned. In terms of machine guns or rifle, yeah. You know. Yeah, that, although I did see a ship, a couple, couple ships away from us that a shell landed in the, in the forward gun tub. And I don't know if those guys jumped out of there or if they were blowing out of there, but they all went out at the same time. <laughs> okay. So I don't know what really happened, and I never did find out. But they were hit, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, there was a couple of ships away from us. So you were under sir, under significant fire. Yeah. Once you land your your ship and, and the cargo or the men and go off, do you come back again with supplies or what is your duty? Not right away, you know, because from from Leyte, Leyte Gulf to Lynn Gain Gulf, that's, uh, you're talking about mm, this, probably seven or eight hundred miles or more. So uh, after we got off the beach, we uh, just anchored in the bay for a while and kept watching out for boxes, you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, after that, we went back down to, uh, I think we went back down to Leyte Gulf. Well, how do they supply the beach? Do they have to make that 700 mile trip to supply the beach? Yeah. They don't have large craft I have a picture of a big ship with supplies that you could transport to the beach for them, but that's not the case, I gather. <clears throat> well, they, uh, they used LSTs mostly because you could run a ship right up on the beach. Right. These other kind of ships you're talking about, cargo ships, they had to put the, their cargo on like one of these um, LCVs, LCVPs, 36-foot boat. Okay. And that's how they had to unload their stuff. Oh, they couldn't unload to an LCT from a cargo ship? They could, but I, I don't never okay, that I don't wasn't what they remember did, yeah. seeing them do that. No, they, they usually, they may have done that more than what I think. But I understand, this was not something that your ship was assigned to do. No, no. No, after we uh, got unloaded, why, we'd go right back to where we came from. Usually. Now, during this, during these periods, starting in New Guinea, when you're going from place to place, are you under risk of submarine attacks? Oh, yeah. How do you avoid that? Or do you zigzag? Or? Well, you have a lot of guys watching. Right. And then a lot of guys spreading rumors, <laughs> you know? They say, oh, I saw a periscope over there, over here. But see, that's good in a way, because that keeps... Uh, that keeps the people on the ball, you know? Right. Yeah. Do you, do you know of any stories where LS, LCTs were under attack from submarines? Was that a target they would take on? 
Oh yeah, I. There was when we first went off up to us over to Australia, an LST had been hit by a torpedo. Just as it was leaving Sydney, I guess, was, or Brisbane. <coughs> oh my gosh! Boy, that that was really blown up. The tank, uh, the back, the stern of the ship was blown up like that, rounding. The deck was rounding like that, blown up like a balloon. Huh. Yeah. Did the sink ship, the ship sink right away, or did it? No, sink? it didn't sink. Okay. No. So it survived that. But it killed a lot of guys. Of on course, it. yeah. Because it, it got hit right in the cruise quarters. Oh, nuts. And, uh, it, I forget how many guys got killed. They never would tell you anything like that over there, but later on, <coughs> since I belong to the Illinois LSD Association, I found out a lot of things that I didn't know before. You know, the guys guys would write letters to the <coughs> paper and tell them how many guys got killed, you know, and, you know. Okay, so we were, I interrupted you again. When you would finish that invasion, you'd return back 700 miles to your home base. Yeah. What happened next? <coughs> well, we got ready for another one. Oh my gosh. Yeah, we, they didn't let us fool around. Mm. Had, had you had your uh, rest and recreation in Australia at this point? I'd forgotten yeah. the timing. Yeah. <coughs> How long was that? How long a period did you get? Ten days. Ten days. Were you, were you received favorably by the Australians? Did they host you well, or? Well, yeah, but <laughs> a friend of mine was uh, some funny things happened to me in Australia to this friend of mine. We weren't together at the time, but some Aussie came up to him and asked him for. Uh, let's see. He asked him for a cigarette, I think. And uh, he, when he rent reached in his pocket to get a cigarette for him. And that's when the guy, uh, you know, poked him one, I guess. Knocked him down, Slugged took his him? money. Oh my gosh. And I had a problem where I was walking along the sidewalk and some Aussie said, hey, come here. And he kind of showed he had a bottle, you know. So we went into a little vestibule in front of a store and I asked him how much, and he said, uh, he said 10 pounds, which is like about 30 bucks. Whoa. So I gave him a 10 pound note, and boy, just a minute I gave it to him, he took off running. Of course, when I opened the bottle up, you know what was in it? <laughs> Tea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Of course. People they didn't. <laughs> why the why do you think there was such an animosity against the people who were helping them? Well, you know, that's the way some people are, you know. Just like over in Iraq, probably got the same thing going on there. These guys were kind of well, they they saw an easy way to make some money, see. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but other than that, I hope you had a a good 10 days of yeah. Out of the theater. Oh, yeah. I, I just remembered that. Cause of course. That's it was a remarkable. Big, yeah. I was a big sucker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or a nice guy. So yeah. you've, you've re, you're, you finished your, rec, your uh, rest, your, your leave, and you're back on, on uh, station. Yeah. What's happening next? Well, let's see. That was in... Say we went down there in 44, February, and then we came back up to Milne Bay. And uh, I forget, we made some more landings in New Guinea, I guess. And then in October of 44, that's when we made uh, the Leyte Gulf okay. invasion. I got us out of sequence. Mm -hmm. And then what happens after that? Well, then, not too long after that, then we made the landing at Lingayen Gulf. And uh, later on, after that was over with, we, uh, let's see, we, we went into Manila, because that had been secured by the soldiers, you know. 
We were the first LST in, in Manila Bay. Oh my gosh. But that was, uh, that bay was full of sunken ships. They said 300 of them all together. Wh of which Navy? Uh, mostly Japanese. You know. this, we went right over the top of some of them. My gosh. Were you able to land? Were you able to go ashore? Yeah. Yeah, we went, uh, we went right up to a dock and, and uh, opened our bow doors and dropped the ramp right on the dock. Oh. We're just maybe just short of the dock. But Did you get time to, to, to see Manila at all? Or? Yeah. Yeah, we walked around a little bit, but it, it was really bombed, bombed bad. Yeah, I got pictures of that. Yeah. This was mostly the bombing that the Americans had done to return, or had that occurred back when the Japanese had taken over? I think it probably, uh, I don't think the Japs bombed Manila, Manila no, too much. Back in 41, yeah. I think, uh, I think, uh, I think most of that was from American bombs. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the, the Japs really treated those people in the Philippines terrible. Was your ship doing some, did it have some duties in the Manila Bay? Is that why you were shipping uh, there? Um, yeah, we must have taken something in there, some kind of cargo. And things, right. Or <laughs> I forget now just what, uh, we, we must have taken, because we were, they sent us up there and we must have had something, cargo right. on the ship to take up in there. Supporting the troops. Yeah. yeah. So what happens next? Well, that's kind of getting toward the, let's see, that was around in, in April. I was going to say around in April 45. Mm -hmm. That Lingay and Gulf invasion was in January 45. And then this Manila, this happened after that. Well, maybe a couple months afterwards. And then, uh, I'm trying to remember, there wasn't too much that we had to do after that. I think we were getting pretty well, the war was getting pretty well over. But I know that there were plans being made for the invasion of the mainland yeah. of Japanese. Now, was your ship going to be part of that planned invasion? Well, yeah, that's, that's where we went back down to New Guinea and we were loading up a bunch of, you know, stuff for the army. And uh, about that time is when they dropped the bomb on Hiroshima. So after that, why? I think we went up to, to Linge, or Leyte Gulf and uh, just anchored there in the bay. And that's about the time I got my orders to come back home. So the war had ended, but mm -hmm. so one thing the bombs had done was make sure you didn't have to be part of an invasion of the Japanese mainland. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you were one of the early, you had enough points to get out among the first people? Yeah, because uh, see, I, I signed up for what they call a minority cruise. And that's until you're 21. Well, see, I went in when I was 17. And uh, I just about got out when I was 21. My gosh. My birthday was in October 20th, and I got out December 5th. So that's pretty good, pretty good timing. Right. How did you get back? How did, how did they get you back to the States? Oh, came back on a Danish transport ship. Oh, my gosh. Took us 20 <laughs> days to come back. From a, let's see. From the 10th of September to about the 1st of October. And that ship was going about 20 knots all the time. Wow. And it could go straight. It didn't have to worry about submarines any longer. Yeah. And what port did, did, did it land on the States? Uh, we went, uh, we were supposed to go into Frisco, 
but it came back into uh, Seattle, and that's where we got off, and then I got to come back to the, to send me back to St. Louis, I think, or to Chicago and then to St. Louis. Now, I didn't get any travel pay coming back home because I joined the Navy in St. Louis, see? Oh. <laughs> and I got discharged in St. Right. Louis. I think it got 75 cents. <laughs> <laughs> Even then, that didn't go very far. <laughs> and where was your home? Michigan. You had to get from St. Louis to Michigan? Well, at the time, I didn't go to Michigan. I went to my uh, brother-in-law's place in Chicago, or my aunt's place, I forget which. Yeah. Now, has that been, that was, was that where you're working, you said? Yeah. When you started out this, in, yeah. this thing? Yeah, and then I, let's see, I, I went back to work for one of my old uh, superintendents. But I didn't work there very long. A couple of weeks and I quit. Then I started something else. <laughs> How was, what was it like to return, having spent you know, your late teens and your early 20s as, yeah. uh, in the Navy? Well, Becoming a uh, senior raider in the Navy. Yeah. yeah. Well, this, this kind of, well, I don't know. Chicago was a pretty good place to go to. They during the war, you didn't even have to pay to ride a streetcar in Chicago. You know, they they always treated servicemen real good. Did you ever consider staying in the Navy as a as a career? Well, no, I was glad to get out, really. But. I don't know if I would have stayed in. I don't think so. Yeah. I mean, you had done well. You were a. You yep. told me your rank when you. Yeah. I was first class when I got on. Yeah. If I'd have stayed in, I could have been chief. But you know, it's. It's still. You're not. Uh, you're not. Uh, uh, you don't have much liberty, you know, unless the Navy says, "Well, you can go and." You can go out yeah. tonight or the weekend or something like that. It's a lot different in civilian life. You can go on every night if you want. But when you're aboard ship and out in the bay, you don't get to come home every night. Exactly. I know I, I can understand. It's just you know, it had been such a formative part of your life that oh, yeah. you know, very yeah. few people have spent the years from 17 to 21 on the in the battle situation. Yeah, I, but I got a lot of benefit from being in the Navy. I, I learned a good trade, electrical trade. Right. Well, is there any other things you'd like to tell us about your memories of those years in the, in the Navy? Well, that pretty much sums it up pretty good. I might have left some stuff out, but that's that's pretty good. And you had a chance to see a part of the world you might not have never seen yeah. otherwise if you... Oh, yeah. Yeah, I never would have gone over there. I never would have gone to Australia or the Philippines or any place else over there. Yeah. Well, I thank you for the interview, and we thank you for your service. We admire, I admire that and appreciate what you did. Okay. And I'm glad you could join us. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Today is